In the long arc of history, modern Pakistan is very much a new nation, and for a country whose name was coined as recently as January 1933, it's only fitting that its capital city is even newer. From the moment it was commissioned in 1959, Pakistan's capital city of Islamabad oh, was as bold an endeavor as the nation of Pakistan itself, an effort to create a booming metropolis where none had existed before. One of only a few truly successful planned cities, Islamabad now boasts a metro area population of more than 2 million. And in a country that still struggles with things like literacy, infant mortality, and infrastructure, Islamabad is in many ways a shining cosmopolitan example of what Pakistan hopes to be. But at the same time, the city's stark contrast against the rest of Pakistan is not by accident. From a building process fraught with difficulties and short-sighted design choices to a finished product that has created a gilded age for Pakistan's elite and pushed its urban poor into slums, the creation of Islamabad is as much a cautionary tale as it is a legitimate achievement of planned city architecture. So in today's installment of Mega Projects, we're going to explore both sides of Islamabad, from conception to completion to the state of affairs today. So, when Pakistan gained its independence in 1947, the government established its seat of power in the port city of Karachi, which was, at the time, midway through a process of rapid expansion. The partition of India, also in 1947, had split the formerly unified British Raj into the predominantly Hindu state of India and the predominantly Muslim state of Pakistan. But, as we've actually covered on our sister channel, Into the Shadows, that partition was brutally painful for both sides. Suffice to say that that partition was accompanied by tremendous loss of life in both India and Pakistan, and it forced millions upon millions of people to migrate across the region. Many of those migrants ended up in Karachi, and as the city's population swelled faster than urban planners could handle, it began to look less and less like a proper capital, and more like what it actually was at the time, a hasty, provisional solution that had little hope of ever being suitable for the job. Karachi spent its time as a capital overwhelmed with refugees, many of whom lived in poverty and squalor, and the city's location on the Indian Ocean brought up legitimate concerns from the Pakistani government around whether it could actually be defended in a time of war. Although the city experienced an economic surge in the 1960s, followed by a construction boom in the 70s, these advances were only relative to what Karachi had been when it was in the height of crisis, and the beleaguered city had a very long way to go before it could be anywhere near capable of holding its own as a proper capital. It was in the face of these difficulties that, in 1958, Pakistan formed a commission to identify a site for a permanent capital city. At the time, there were no cities in the country that would have been anywhere near capable of handling the people or industry that a capital city brings, and none that could provide suitable infrastructure to support new and often wealthy communities. Whatever capital Pakistan did get would have to be built from the ground up. Before long, Pakistani authorities settled on an area just outside the city of Rawalpindi, where local road networks were well developed enough to get building material to the new capital and laborers could be housed without having to build the required facilities from the ground up. Rawalpindi was located in the Himalayan foothills, close to an area that was, at the time, expected to host a so called Trans Asian Highway, which has since evolved into the Asian Highway Network. And finally, it addressed the strategic concerns of the Pakistani military, where the altitude, terrain, and absence of sea made the location a far more defensible place if war with India or another regional power broke out. The new capital city would be built while leaning on the urban and natural assets of Rawalpindi, and the capital, named Islamabad or the City of Islam, would become an indispensable part of the vision for Pakistan's future. Now, let me take a moment to tell you about our fantastic sponsor today, making this video possible and also making your website possible because yes, today's sponsor is Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform for unleashing your creativity online. I've used Squarespace. My personal website's on Squarespace. I made it in an afternoon. You go onto the site, there's a load of beautiful templates, and you pick one, you're like, yeah, that looks good for me. You take it into their custom drag and drop editor. It's called Fluid Engine now. When I actually made my website, it was called something different, but now there's Fluid Engine. It's even better. It's even easier than what was already easy. You go in, you drag stuff around, then you're like, okay, that beautiful picture of a hill, let's replace that with my face. That beautiful picture of a lake, let's replace that with the logo of one of my channels. And boom, it's 
really done just like that. It's super easy and it looks good. It's super fast. You don't have to worry about anything. Plus they've got like email campaigns. I used to pay a fortune to an unnamed company for like email, emailing. Like people would leave their email addresses and I used to, but I don't bother. I'd like send people emails. It used to cost a fortune. You can now just do it with Squarespace. It's included. Why not? So look, if you're ready to supercharge your online presence, and I mean, maybe you want to set up a shop. I don't know. I'm just talking about me personally. You could do whatever you want on Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your masterpiece of a website, go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Squarespace.com slash megaprojects, code megaprojects. And now back to today's video. The early plan for Islamabad relied on the concept of Dynamopolis. That is, a dynamic metropolis. As the city's urban planner, a Greek architect named C.A. Doxiadis saw it, Islamabad would form the centerpiece to a broader metropolitan area, which would fuse the city not just with Raoul Pindi, but areas that would be designated as a national park. Doxiadis was a believer in looking at cities as an interaction between physical structures like roads and buildings and the humans that lived and worked inside them, as well as a third factor, the broader society that those people lived in, and a fourth, the natural environment provided by the landscape. In a practical sense, that meant that the first settlements at Islamabad would be placed at a T-junction with Raoul Pindi and the local national parks, with the long highway stretching into the distance where Islamabad would eventually be built. But it wouldn't be built until there were enough people to fill a new development, and then another, and then another. In hindsight, this staggered building approach has been one of Islamabad's major advantages, with new developments moving, as needed, in a single direction northeastward instead of just sprawling out at random. The city was planned block by block in a rigid gridiron pattern with certain zones allotted for residential, education, commercial, and governmental functions. From the very start of development, this started to raise eyebrows. After all, such tightly defined zones tend to work well in theory and actually fail to serve their residents in practice. But the zones began to seem even more sketchy when it was revealed that they would be explicitly stratified on the basis of income, with communities that were directly intended, even before they were built, to keep people of similar wealth together. Not only that, but those communities would all be organized around central shopping districts, which make good sense to keep traffic out of neighborhoods, but had the potential to make auto travel in those shopping districts, which, by the way, is exactly what they were designed for, into a roiling mess of traffic. And the further one looked into Islamabad's master plan, the more it seems as if CA Doxiadis and company had a crystal clear vision for what they expected Islamabad to be, and very little in the way of a backup plan if literally anything less than that ideal vision ended up becoming reality. By example, the city was built on a strict hierarchy of road widths. 1,200 foot wide roads fed outward to 600 foot wide roads and then to 300 foot wide roads, with no real consideration given to what would happen if the city didn't motorize enough to fill those massive roads or if that arrangement of roads could become impractical once the city started to grow and change with its population. The city plan also ignored some elements of the natural landscape, using flat roads rather than curved ones despite the likelihood of heavy rainfall and erosion and prescribing that large parts of the landscape just be leveled and flattened instead of just building with the rise and fall of the land. In 1960, Pakistan's Capital Development Authority was established to oversee the construction process, with near total discretion in the decisions required to actually build the city. The CDA was made up almost entirely of foreign architects and planners, and only three major planners on the project were Pakistani, although the project was under direction from Pakistan's own political appointees. Perhaps this too should have been a bit of a warning sign that Pakistan lacked the personnel to truly bring Islamabad in line with its architectural vision. But nonetheless, construction got underway that same year, just a little over a decade after Pakistan had become a nation at all. So when it came time to break ground in Islamabad, Pakistan's labor landscape was in dire need of jobs. So rather than rely on foreign contractors and heavy machinery to do the hard work of building a capital, the city was instead built using vast numbers of laborers armed with relatively simple tools. In fact, large-scale construction machinery was actually banned from the process in an effort to get as many builders out to Islamabad as possible. And although this significantly slowed the city's pace of construction, it did provide a valuable lifeline to many Pakistani families who might otherwise have gone without work. But almost as soon as construction began, it became clear that the architect's master plan would be very difficult to implement in practice. 
The board in charge of Islamabad's development had no say over the city of Rawalpindi, where a separate mess of bureaucratic urban planning boards had their own discretion over what development happened and when. As a result, Rawalpindi, which had been so integral for the plan of Islamabad, was removed from the development process almost immediately. Instead, Rawalpindi moved into a support role for the project, housing workers and accommodating the first bits of government that moved in. Unfortunately, Rawalpindi received very few resources compared to Islamabad, so even if the city's bureaucrats did want to modernize alongside Islamabad, they just didn't have the means to do so. As a result, Islamabad's master plan fractured quickly, although it wouldn't actually be abandoned until the late 1970s. Instead, the developers went ahead with the plan strictly for Islamabad proper. The city was envisioned as a low-lying, spread-out metropolis, taking full advantage of the available space instead of building upward, and rather than erecting skyscrapers or elaborate monuments, most work in the residential areas consisted of leveling lots, building single-story homes, and trying to make those homes into neighborhoods. Similarly, its commercial zones were filled with the sort of relatively standard office buildings and shopping malls that builders around the world, and in Pakistan, uh, were more than able to handle by that time. The real architectural challenge was the city's political and administrative zones. Pakistan's presidential palace, by example, was built in a cosmopolitan steppe pyramid style with elaborate nearby fountains, a zoo, and stables for a hundred horses on the premises. The Parliament House took all of 11 years to build, across almost 600,000 square feet, and the Secretariat Building, the Cabinet's headquarters, is a sprawling, elaborate complex that was pieced together by a long list of architects, each responsible for individual subsections of the building. Most impressive of all is the Faisal Mosque, the national mosque of Pakistan and the fifth largest in the entire world, comprising an eight-sided shell meant to resemble a Bedouin tent and four minarets, each over 250 feet tall. Like the rest of the city, these detailed massive structures were built without heavy machinery by the tools and labor of construction workers from all across Pakistan. During the construction process, international onlookers had reason to be skeptical on whether or not Islamabad would ever be a success. After all, Pakistan at the time was not a wealthy place, and uh, the recent example of Brasilia, a capital city that Brazil had also made from the ground up just a few years earlier, showed just how much of a drain a planned capital could be on a country's limited resources. But in Pakistan specifically, there was reason to grip one's teeth and advocate pushing forward with the project anyway. The alternative was trying to get Karachi into shape to be a capital, and that simply was just not going to happen. Construction pressed on through the mid-1960s until finally the city's essential works were declared complete in 1966. From there, Islamabad continued to develop its residential and commercial areas as more and more elements of government made themselves comfortable in Pakistan's new seat of power. In 1981, Islamabad was designated a special territory independent of the surrounding Punjab province, and although it was kept administratively distinct from nearby Rawalpindi, the two cities spent decades intermingling and becoming more reliant upon each other until today's Islamabad, very much including Rawalpindi, could finally take shape. The modern city of Islamabad is among the most modern cosmopolitan cities in all of South Asia and has quickly grown into a governmental and diplomatic powerhouse not just in Pakistan but on the world stage. As Pakistan has continued to grow in its economic power, Islamabad has been a direct beneficiary and business centers like the Centaurus Complex and the Blue Area District have risen up out of the ground as a result. The city is Pakistan's largest educational hub, boasting several universities, and its population of expatriates has only grown with time. Rather than a concrete jungle like New York or Hong Kong, Islamabad has remained lush and green, surrounded by incredible, well-preserved forests and national parks, all coming together to make Islamabad one of the most visually stunning capital cities in the world. But with all the intense and often prescriptive work that went into planning out the lay of the city, it should perhaps be unsurprising that, in practice, Islamabad is something of a stale place to be in. Its layout, designed on a utopian ideal of what a city of the future might be, ends up somewhat cold and sterile in many places. Go into Islamabad with a checklist of things that a city should have, and you could probably check off the entire list, but the variety, the community, and the powerful energy of a thriving city, they're all missing at its center. And word gets around. While there's not an explicit shortage of people willing to live in Islamabad, it's not exactly a place that makes young, aspiring Pakistanis light up when they speak of the possibility of making it. At least, unless they want a career in politics, that is. And now we should be clear, people absolutely do move to Islamabad chasing opportunity, but these decisions are more due to the simple fact that Islamabad is one of the few major urban centers that Pakistan can offer at all. Islamabad's combination of quick economic growth and the fact that a majority of its residential zones were built with middle class or 
wealthy individuals in mind have led to perhaps Islamabad's worst problem in the modern day. A housing crisis in which many of the laborers, service workers, and domestic personnel who are responsible for making Islamabad run smoothly can't afford housing in the same city where they work. And without readily available housing options, those people have had to create their own places to live in rapidly expanding slums and shanty towns that now comprise about 10% of the city's land area. Here, working Pakistanis mixed with refugees from Afghanistan and elsewhere and religious minorities are significantly overrepresented compared to the status elsewhere in Pakistani society. Clean waters? Hard to come by. Sanitation services are woefully under-equipped to handle the number of people living there. And with Pakistan's very low daily wages for unskilled workers, it's difficult for most slum residents to ever work their way out towards something better. In many ways, Islamabad has thus divided into two cities, one in which political and business elites are welcome to indulge in the pleasures of a modern metropolis, and one in which the people responsible for that metropolis struggle to keep up. Islamabad has expanded outward in recent years, leapfrogging into new settlements and developments for the wealthy, and each time a new neighborhood ends up with a new slum nearby, filling its own part of the city's urban sprawl. The city's population has steadily grown to the point that its metro area today boasts some two million residents, over half of whom have arrived in the 21st century. But for every one person who comes to Islamabad to enjoy the high life, so does another who's likely to spend years or even decades scraping by. In many ways, this reflects life across Pakistan, where just 20% of the national population commands nearly half of its income. But like in many nations, Pakistan's capital city is a caricature of the problems being faced elsewhere. They're just bigger in Islamabad, and they're harder to ignore. This was a problem that the city's architect, C.A. Doxiadis, had tried to express before Islamabad was even built. In his own words, a capital city exercises great influence on the entire country. Thus, its inhabitants should not belong only to one social group, economic, political, ethnic, etc., but should belong to as many groups as possible. Certainly, Deoxyardis and the team behind Islamabad's master plan had not intended to fill their city with shanty towns, even if lower class areas were explicitly segregated in the initial plan. But as Islamabad was built, the city's decision to abandon its master plan has led to the sort of haphazard urban sprawl where these avoidable problems only grow larger each year. In the face of this major issue, Islamabad has attempted to make itself better, but urban economic development has been badly underpowered in recent years with not enough money traveling into the right areas to make it a truly livable city. As the city has covered more and more territory, the surrounding forest has been lucky enough to survive, but rising temperatures and dryness in the region have prompted early signs of a pending ecological collapse at the same time that Islamabad's population has continued to swell. Because as much as both cities have intertwined, their decades-long history apart has led Rawalpindi to shouldering the burden of Islamabad's wealth inequality. When it comes to Islamabad's future, the unfortunate reality is that the city and its people can just expect more of the same. The city's public works and infrastructure are crumbling from a lack of maintenance, and the few efforts the city has made to mitigate those problems simply aren't enough. The city only just got a bus system in 2015 with no rail or other public intracity transport to speak of except for a mess of taxi cabs and ride shares. Because the city was never built to be population dense, its developments continue to consume more and more land, increasing the city's surface area in a sprawl of single-family homes, but not fostering any of the dedicated centers that a city needs to thrive. In fact, the city has struggled to even regulate its own developments, with many of them being built illegally or without public approval, and Islamabad's near-complete dependency on cars has begun to make the city's major roads impossible. All things considered, we still must give credit to Islamabad for doing that one great, difficult thing that so many planned cities fail to do. To put it simply, that's that it exists. People live here. It serves an important function and has forever avoided the list of misguided planned city attempts that were dead on arrival. But as impressive a feat as Pakistan accomplished by building Islamabad, it's been chronically unable to follow through on delivering the city that Islamabad might have been. On its current course, Islamabad is headed down the long and painful road to urban decay. And unless something radical changes, that's precisely where the city will eventually end up.